So one way to think about deep reinforcement learning is that it, it makes agents like, say, autonomous vehicles or processing, processing machines, makes them aware of each other so that they can act as a team. And it's that teamwork that actually produces radically different results. Welcome to Uptech Report. This is our Applied Tech series. Uptech Report is sponsored by TerraLeap. Learn how to leverage the power of video at terraleap.io. Today, I'm joined by my guest, Chris Nicholson, who's based in San Francisco, California. He's the founder and CEO of PathMind. Welcome, Chris. Good to have you on, man. Hi, Alex. Thanks for having me on. Now, PathMind, uh, what I've got from your site, is a SaaS platform that enables businesses to apply reinforcement learning, deep reinforcement learning to real world scenarios without data science expertise. So for those out there, um, particularly you're focused on manufacturing and supply chain organizations, and you're trying to help industrial engineers, simulation modelers get better results with reinforcement learning. Uh, this may be a platform for those out there that wanna be able to check out. Now on your site, Chris, you state, make better decisions with AI. Help me understand, like how, how, did, um, how did you guys start with Pathfinder? What was the, the problem you were looking to solve? Hmm. You know, I got into AI almost eight years ago now, um, kind of through the door of deep learning. And deep learning, a lot of people have heard about it. Um, it's, it's basically deep neural networks. Um, and it's, it's really made huge strides in our, in our ability to say, recognize images, um, understand language, understand uh, speech as well. Um, so, so I was coming into AI through, through that door of deep learning. And it turns out that there was this thing called deep reinforcement learning that actually does something beyond recognition, right? It does something yeah. beyond, say, object recognition in an image. It's not a perceptive form of AI. Um, it's what we would call a prescriptive form of AI. It tells you what you ought to do, right? So it it, it makes decisions, um, usually in a simulated environment like like a video game. Um, so for for me, and I think for a lot of people, that's a lot more impressive. Right? It's a lot more intelligent to decide what to do in order to achieve your goal, right? It's, it's, it's somewhat more closer to what, what a human thinks, right? Versus just an AI yeah. that says, oh, this is green, this is blue, yeah. uh, versus this is green and blue, you should probably go with the green one because of X. Yeah, yeah, and if you see an algorithm like recognize a kitten in a photo, you do think to yourself, my three-year-old can do that. But if you see an algorithm win the game of go against a world champion, you never think my three-year-old can do that, right? So, so, so it's another level and of- that's where that's where deep reinforcement learning, that's yeah. where it comes into play. Yeah. So help me understand just use cases for, uh, for deep reinforcement learning uh, mm -hmm. right now, like actual mm -hmm. use cases for, that you've seen. Yeah. So beyond the video games, which everybody's kind of seen, there are actually a lot of really interesting, really interesting real world use cases, especially in business where you can quantify your rewards, right? So obviously everybody in business is driven to achieve certain goals. Um, some are intangible, some are very quantifiable, right? Especially around profit, safety, carbon emissions, right? We can really measure what's going on. And as soon as you can measure how close you are to your goal, deep reinforcement learning can actually help you, right? Because the way reinforcement learning works is it takes penalties and rewards. So let's say whether you reach your goal or not would, would cause a reward, how close you are to that goal might cause a reward, right? It can take those penalties and rewards and it can learn from them, right? So in say classical deep learning with object recognition, if you say that's a dog when it's really a cat, you get, you're wrong and, and your predictive model has to learn, it updates, right? In deep reinforcement learning, uh, the structure is really, I take, I take a step and if I get closer to my goal, if I reach my goal, I get a reward. And if I get farther away, I have to learn, right? I get, I get a penalty. Right. So anything you can conceive of like that, deep reinforcement learning can be applied to. And specifically, concretely, we see it being applied in a lot of factories and a lot of warehouses and supply chain nodes uh, where people are they care about throughput. They care about efficiency. Right. So they're measuring very closely. How many items am I moving through my factory? How quickly am I moving those items, say, onto a truck to get out of here? Right. How fast are my, my machines able to operate? Um, is anybody running it? How many collisions am I causing, right? As I move these things through, all those things feed into the rewards, right? That we give the algorithm and the algorithm based on its vast experience, right? Digital experience um, is gonna be telling you, hey, I see this going on in the factory now. I think you ought to do these things to increase your throughput. 
is all deep reinforcement learning the same? Like, like no matter how one would say, I want to apply it here, I want to apply it there, or is it each time, is it applied differently? Mm. There are a ton of choices to make with deep reinforcement learning, and that's true of most of AI, right? So it typically requires a lot of expertise uh, because expertise, obviously, is the ability to make the right choices. Uh, unfortunately, not a lot of people in the world have been trained to use deep reinforcement learning, um, even fewer than the ones who have been trained to use AI in general. Um, and so one reason why we exist is because those people could probably use or benefit from the accuracy of deep reinforcement learning, uh, mm -hmm. but they don't yet have the training. Uh, and so one thing that PathMind does is it just vastly simplifies what it takes to get good results out of a deep reinforcement learning agent. Help me understand, like someone that uses your platform, what are they using, or, or maybe they're not doing, using anything, but what are they doing before they are starting to implement deep reinforcement learning? Um, and, and that's another question. Are people coming to you who have already been trying deep reinforcement learning, or are they coming to you fresh out of the gate? Like, I've heard about this, this uh, uh, deep learning, like, now I'm ready to do it, and you might be a good solution. So help me understand, like, the use yeah. cases there. Yeah, it's a bit of both, actually. So th there's deep reinforcement learning is just one optimization tool among many, and these are industries that have cared a lot about optimization for a long time. Um, the way they've approached optimization in the past is with some tools called mathematical solvers, um, in linear programming. That's, that's a really common tool that people use. And it's very useful actually, um, but it has some limits. Um, and one of the places where mathematical solvers run into um, kind of are blind is when you apply them to really complex and dynamic situations. So maybe you have multiple agents moving on a factory floor. Maybe you have a lot of variability in your inputs um, or in the environment somehow. Those mathematical solvers suddenly can't solve the problem anymore. It's too complex and too dynamic. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of what you and I and factory operators account, um, encounter in real life are complex dynamic situations, right? Mm -hmm. So if I want an optimizer that actually can understand where I'm at, the dilemmas I face that and make it and, and make a recommendation to me, if I want that optimizer, uh, deep reinforcement learning is one of the only algorithms I can turn to. Would you say that it, it really takes it to a whole another level, different level that maybe they hadn't had before? And, and if, if, if that is the case, what would be the advice that you give to someone in, in, in a, a space and supply chain or manufacturing when they're like, they're looking at, at applying it and they're trying to do it the right way or the best way possible? What advice would you be, would you be giving? Yeah. Um, deep reinforcement learning can take it to another level, depending on the problem, of course. But uh, we do consistently see that people are achieving, let's say, 10% um, improvements in their performance. That, that's just something pretty typical for us. Sometimes uh, it's a lot more. Sometimes it's a bit less. Um, but so these double-digit percentage improvements are quite common. Um, and then the, the question people always ask is, how is that happening? Right? How is that possible? Because in supply chain and in manufacturing um, and logistics, they've been operating lean for so long. They've optimized the heck out of everything. How are you squeeze? You know, they 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 fight hard to squeeze another one percent of efficiency out of their operation. So how does deep reinforcement learning get an additional ten? Right? It's kind of it's it's implausible, to say the least. Um, and the the answer to that question of why is that deep reinforcement learning can coordinate multiple agents at the same time. Right. So when if you've got a factory or a warehouse, it's never a single agent situation. Right. There's always a crowd. You got a lot of moving parts. Right. Interacting, moving over the field. And it's really helpful to think of all those moving parts as being part of a team. Right. Um, if they're incentivized individually, they're going to get in each other's way, just as, you know, a team of five year olds might get in each other's way. Right. But if you incentivize them and you train them to play as a team, um, then all of a sudden you're junior Olympics level, right? Like you, you, they, they cohere on another scale and they become a unit. Um, so one way to think about deep reinforcement learning is that it, it makes agents like say autonomous vehicles or processing, processing machines, makes them aware of each other so that they can act as a team. And it's that teamwork that actually produces radically different results. Help me understand the kind of history for you guys. Like where, where did, what was the story of how you got to where you guys are today? Mm. Yeah. So, so like I said, I, I came in through deep learning 
And we, we had a deep reinforcement learning element to that. We were building a big open source project. It was a lot of fun. Um, it was a hard business because open source software is free, right? So we were getting, we were getting to know deep reinforcement learning and we were approached by some interesting people um, who said, hey, hey those algorithms um, might be helpful for my situation. And their situation were these really hard, um, complex optimization scenarios with physical operations. Um, and the more we looked into it, the more we saw the more we became fascinated uh, by it, not just because it's a cool application of AI, although you know that's great too, yeah. um, but it's it has an impact on multiple levels, right? So it's able to make businesses operate more intelligently, and that's why they're buying the software. But by making them more efficient, it's also serving larger causes that I think everybody, probably a lot of your listeners, care about as well, right? So climate change, you just can't you, you can't turn away from it right? Weird things are happening in the climate. Texas is freezing over, right? Crazy, crazy stuff is happening. New volatility is being introduced uh, that business has to deal with. Um, and some of that has to do with global warming. So global warming is a function of emissions. Emissions are a function of uh, kind of output burning energy. And so if I can come in and I can say, I'll make you radically more efficient and you'll still meet your production quotas. What I'm really doing is I'm coming at a climate change sideways. Right. Uh, so everybody talks about Tesla. I love them. Everybody talks about electrification, solar. Right. Those are all hugely important. People don't talk about that boring but highly important business of just making existing operations more efficient. Right. But that's what we do. What's what can you speak as far as like your roadmap and what you're working on? Um, maybe in some interesting features that you just rolled out or will um, that you want to share? Mm. Yeah, our roadmap. There's, there's a lot of uh, pieces to it, I guess. But what we've got now um, is the ability to train a reinforcement learning agent and deploy it on the edge in a factory so it can serve uh, low latency predictions to these machines. Um, and all those machines can act in coordination. Uh, we're slowly moving. So, so up until now, we've been working a lot in simulations to train our models. And we're slowly moving straight to uh, real data. Um, and obviously many more people have real data than have simulations, right? So, so being able to expose these agents to the world, just like you and I are exposed to the world, right? To increase their intelligence seems, seems like a, a good way to go, right? You have, you have fewer moving parts. So, so our roadmap is training these agents on real data. Right now, someone will provide their simulated data or maybe just a record of history data to your to this simulation, to the platform, to run it and be able to get better insights then to take back and then apply it to the, their actual uh, situation. What you're looking towards going to is it's actively getting the data from all those different endpoints and learning from it real time. It's, it's close to that. So um, okay. what, what our users do now, so we serve industrial engineers and simulation modelers, mechanical engineers, and, and they, they very often have a simulation of some sort, a digital replica of their underlying physical operations, right? Uh, those simulations can take a long time to build. They're highly valuable and, the, and they're very useful for reinforcement learning agents, but it's, uh, it's very important to make sure you expose those, in, uh, those agents to real data, right? And so we can run some real data through the simulations already, but exposing those agents first and foremost to data and raw data, um, and rather than training them for a, a lengthy amount of time in the simulation is one thing that we think will help some people use reinforcement learning uh, better. Could you see a, a world where it'll be active reinforcement learning, meaning like there, there won't be a, a separate loop. It'll actually be learning and applying what it, mm. it learns. Would, mm. is that, is that, have yeah. you seen that happening and do you see ha that happening soon? That, that is happening uh, and that's going to become more widespread. So, so by active learning, I, I, I'm kind of, what I'm hearing you saying is online learning, like I'm exposed to data and in real time, I'm learning the lessons from that data and I'm altering my behavior to better achieve my goals, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, we call that online learning. That's, um, that's very important, especially if say you're embedded in a vehicle and the weather conditions are changing, right? Mm -hmm. Or, or you're, you're driving somewhere new. You, you just, you need to be able to adapt to circumstances, even circumstances you haven't been exposed to before, right? So active learning is very important. Yeah. In, in a I'm manufacturing, yeah. uh, yes, we will. And, and, uh, in the manufacturing and, and supply chain world, mm -hmm. where is the balance though of allowing uh, 
a reinforcement model to deep reinforcement model to to learn from and apply the changes automatically versus having human insight and oversight yeah. and involvement where's the yeah. balance yeah yeah that's a really gr- great question um and i have to, i have to say first of all humans are underrated uh humans have a role in in these scenarios uh, and we don't envision a world of purely dark factories um, inhabited only by machines. Um, the human operators, the domain experts um, who have a theory of their own operations are extremely important. And, and very often the most important decisions should be left to them. Um, but what reinforcement learning can do uh, in many cases is it can surface strategies for them that they hadn't thought of themselves, right? It can expose them to new possibilities. Um, it can point out things in, in their strategic layout that they haven't noticed, right? So there are cases where with an autonomous vehicle, a little Roomba driving around the floor, you don't need a human operator. You don't want someone sitting in a trailer steering that remotely. It's not important enough, right? But when you're operating a whole factory and you're deciding huge, you're making huge scheduling decisions about what's gonna get processed next, right? There's a human with their finger on the button, but maybe they're operating by gut right now. Right? Maybe they're really letting their gut instinct or some kind of descriptive analytics about what happened yesterday guide them. And one thing reinforcement learning can do is it, it, it can act as decision support, um, mm-hmm. w- which can lead to pretty significant improvements in this kind of human machine hybrid. So what deep reinforcement learning is, is allowing people to go from just gut to more data dashboards of, of, of um, having re- reinforcement to what your gut says is right yeah. or wrong. Yeah. Yeah, and, and we think about it, we don't, we're not a software, as a company, we don't produce software, we produce cyborgs, right? So I'm not manufacturing humans, but I'm manufacturing the software that, that links up and interfaces with them really tightly so that their powers expand. You're making cyborgs. I love it. Just, I, I love just the perspective of, of how it, this te- technology should augment us and allow mm-hmm. us to be able to make better, smarter, faster decisions um, and more insightful decisions. And that sounds like this type of technology and your platform is aimed to do. Mm-hmm. That's right. Can you just share the future? What, what do you see in maybe two, three years from now, or even five or 10? What is it going to look like? Mm. Yeah. So, you know, operational technology can move slow. So I think a lot of the things that are present now in one or two factories will simply be much more widespread, right? Which would be a control tower, a center of intelligence in these physical operations. It's really taking it, it has a global view of everything going on, everything coming in, everything going out and everybody inside, right? Um, And it can help coordinate all those actions, right? So calibration is terribly difficult. If you've ever played the beer game in supply chain, right? You know how hard it is to time the the orders, right? To get a smooth flow from the factory to the retailer. Um, So just getting transparency, Right. And then some intelligence and intelligence layer on top of that uh, transparent data layer uh, will lead to vastly more efficient operations up and down, up and down the supply chain from manufacturers down to the, the consumers. Um, so in, in five years, if that is widespread, I'll be super happy. Right. I think that's 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 a that's a reasonable thing to hope for. It's actually and as I'm sure, you know, it's very hard to predict more than five years in the future. Um especially because AI is changing so fast, right? So like, think about the last, in the, in the eight years I've been in AI, um, we went from barely recognizing images well to having superhuman abilities to recognize images. We went from barely doing NLP well with deep learning to being able to generate entire paragraphs of novel text that sounds human. It's, it's eerie and it's creepy. And it's powerful, right? And and all of those things are moving forward together. So are there are there kind of um, overlaps between all these AI advances along with IoT? Absolutely, right? Like that that image recognition, that kind of perceptive ability, is is the basis of how reinforcement learning senses its environment, right? So the better we get at that, the better those machines are going to be able to steer themselves. Uh, as, as we look at NLP, right? National lang- natural language processing being a, able to respond to language. I mean maybe the humans in the warehouse are going to be talking to those machines, right? And maybe the machines will be talking back, right? And I hope they're polite. <laughs> let's, let's make sure we get nice reinforcement on being polite. In, in the, for sure. <laughs> it starts at home, Alex. 
<laughs> with our kids. Now, um, help me understand just a couple more, more stats about, about you guys. Um, is, is it a, a typical SaaS, so monthly, yearly subscription that like um, research or whatever they could sign up for? How does that work? It's a typical SaaS. It's a yearly subscription, although for students and academics, we have some project-based stuff. Right? We have shorter term subscription subscriptions so that they can kind of prove something out for themselves. Yep. And as far as um, integrations um, or with other solutions or whatever, how, do you have anything that you can share? Yeah, sure. So we integrate with AnyLogic. AnyLogic is a really powerful uh, simulation software for stocks and flows, factories, warehouses, ports, airports. Um, it's, uh, it's very widespread in its use. It's all over uh, kind of in industrial engineering. A lot of those folks use it. Um, students and academics, a lot of those folks use it for that for that specific layer of, of simulation software, which is kind of business operations, right? Um, so every and that range and even government op operations, right? So you could everything from like COVID vaccine distribution on the government side, all the way over to um, throughput and efficiency on the factory and warehouse side. Um, we integrate with open source Python. So all of the typical tools of the AI stack uh, that range from OpenAI Jim to Ray and RLlib to TensorFlow, we integrate with all of that, right? So, so that's a very active world, all that open source stuff. People are building a lot of simulations in Python as well. Um, nice. Yep, and, and so that's what we do. And, and I think the, the important thing for folks, obviously we, in, we integrate with a lot of things on the inter infrastructure side, but our users don't have to think about it, right? Mm -hmm. So they don't have to choose a cloud. They don't have to set up distributed computing and maintain and monitor it. We just do that for them, right? And we've mm -hmm. set it up in a way where they can train models very quickly and cheaply, maybe more cheaply than they could manage to do themselves. And, and would you say that's kind of the real benefit of choosing your platform versus like they, they could do deep reinforcement learning on manage to figure it out themselves using open source models, but you're providing a more streamlined, uh, all-in-one solution that they mm -hmm. not mostly all-in-one that, that just provides mm -hmm. it and just makes it a lot easier to, to roll with it. Yeah, some can and do, uh, do it themselves. Um, others embark on that endeavor and a year later uh, come over to us, right? Uh, just the thing about open source, and I worked in it for a long time, uh, it's not open source's job to reduce complexity, right? Open source is a bunch of components that, that people cobble together. Um, and one of the ways that open source companies uh, make money is by solving the complexity of open source, which they sometimes create, right? So, so, so what you, if you're going into open source, you better, you better be ready to, to deal with complexity. And, and one of the things that we help people do is, is ignore, move past that complexity so they can focus on the complexity of their physical operations, right? Which is the thing they need to solve. Nice. Um, and for you guys, um, how big is the team now? 15. Nice. And, and um, any, anything else you'd want to share that would people should know about if they wanted to kind of get started or look into it? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I think one of the most interesting things that they'll find when they start working with reinforcement learning is they'll, they'll have a chance to think about incentives, right? Because in this branch of machine learning, um, what you do is you write reward functions. So in supervised learning, you label data, and those are the right answers. In unsupervised, you kind of predict a, pr a probability distribution of the data. But in reinforcement learning, that feedback loop is based on what you decided is desirable. That's your reward function. Give my agent a reward when it reaches its destination without a collision or when it produces more items in a factory, right? So, so it's, it's really, it's a chance, forgive this, this way of putting it, but it's a chance to play God, right? You, you can construct incentives, you can design a society of robots, right? And you can figure out which incentives, just like the legislators determine the law that incents you and me, right? You can figure out which incentives push behavior, group behavior in one direction or another. It's fascinating. Um, you, you can watch different societies of robots form, right? And, and to serve those goals because the, the robots are not rebels, right? You tell them what to do, they're gonna learn it. They'll do it uh, and they'll do it uh, much more precisely than you would want. They'll do what you said you wanted rather than what you wanted, right? Which is all about alignment. Um, so, so thinking, and, and what's really interesting, what I, I really just can't get over is kind of the emergence of swarm intelligence when you have multiple robots. And by that, I mean, you have this complexity, you have a bunch of individual agents. You could go to each one and just say, go as fast as you can or deliver as many, uh, 
deliver as many items as you can. And that would lead to a certain speed, but also to a lot of chaos and collisions. But if you address them as a group, right, and you shape these collective incentives, right, kind of like the golden rule, right, you shape these collective incentives um, for them, very often new behaviors emerge that you didn't program, right? So what, one thing we see is that these robots who normally should, would be speeding off to their destination, they'll get out of each other's way, right? They'll sacrifice for the team. Nobody programmed that because they know after many years of, com of compute experience, right? Run in parallel, which only takes a few hours, but like they've got years of experience by the time they come out of there. Um, they that. know that getting out of the way will maximize the collective outcome, mm -hmm. which is what I told them I cared about. There's no selfishness in, in, in the robot's mindset because you, they see the collective good. You can program in the self, selfishness and you can program it out, <laughs> which is different than real life. <laughs> Only if I could, yeah, we could do that in ourselves and, yeah. and for those around us. I, I, I love the, the passion I can tell in you that you have for, for this topic. And it's the reason why I imagine you started this company and, and you guys are, are leading it forward. So thank you so much for, for sharing the, both the insight and, and where you guys are headed. For those um, that want to learn more, go to pathmind.com and then you'll be able to sign up for free. Is that a, What's a for good first step that folks should be able to take? They're, they're free accounts. Um, we've got simulations already hosted in PathMind. So if you come sign up for a free account in two minutes, you will see reinforcement learning in action, uh, kind of all these collective incentives leading to uh, the outcomes uh, you want. I love it. I love it. Well, thank you again so much, Chris, for your time and everyone for joining us. We'll see you on the next episode of Uptech Report. Have you seen a company using AI, machine learning, or other technology to transform the way we live, work, and do business? Go to uptechreport.com and let us know.